All right. Well, we have a busy program tonight. We have not one, not two, but three guest speakers. So, Mark, you could. And I want to thank you, Chris. This was Chris's idea. He realized, wow, we've got three different guys building the same airplane with some small differences. But these are some pretty highly qualified guys doing the building. They've had a lot of experience. They've got a lot of knowledge to share. We were anxious to have them get up here. Uh, well, I think we're going to start with Carlo, if I'm not mistaken. I think Todd. Or, or Todd, either one of you. I think Todd's going to build on Todd. Okay, all right. Todd, Todd will start. Uh, I, I'm not going to steal much more thunder because we got to get going. But uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you guys for showing up. I think we're going to find this interesting. Obviously, there's a pretty good reason this airplane is so popular lately, and uh, I'm anxious to look or l learn about it. So. All right. Cool. Thank you, Todd. Great. Uh, oh, do we have a clicky thing. Yes, we. There do. we go. All right. Okay. Got to be clicky thing. Um, Figure out where I'm going to stand here. Uh, I'm used to having a little presenter screen here, so I'll be ad-libbing and staring at that a lot. Uh, sounds good. So I, I got a call uh, uh, a while back uh, from a guy named Carlo, and he said, hey, I'm building the same airplane. You want to get together and talk about it? We did. Uh, then I got a uh, uh, note from Mark that said, do you want to talk about it here uh, at the chapter meeting with Carlo? And oh, by the way, there's this other guy building a uh, uh, four place, Neil. So anyways, uh, uh, can we get everybody together and do this? So here's how it's gonna work. I'm gonna do the boring stuff, which is to talk about the overview on the airplane, uh, a little bit about the control specifically, because we don't wanna shortchange that. We got two of them being built. Um, Carlo's gonna come up and do show and tell. Remember show and tell in kindergarten? Oh, see, like the cool stuff. So we've got all sorts of cool stuff here. Uh, and then Neil's gonna come up and uh, that's the meat of the presentation when you get right down to it because uh, it's a um, uh, kit. Uh, he's well along with it. I think you've got it covered. Is that, that the scoop? And, and beautiful airplane, fantastic airplane. So a uh, lot of pictures. Uh, so it's going to be a visuals rich evening tonight, which is really good. Okay, so without further ado, I committed to 20 minutes to get through the stack of slides, which uh, any of you that's uh, sat through any sort of contractor briefings, uh, that's optimistic, but we'll get there. Yeah. So anyways, uh, just, just uh, this was supposed to be um, actually moving pictures, that thing that we see in movie theaters and all that. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, internet. So we've got a South African Registry Patrol uh, center mass there. I did that for Carlo for obvious reasons. Um, some ribs that uh, relate to the scratch build part. And then this is a uh, Bearhawk 5 that was uh, doing a very short landing. I think the ground roll was about 250 feet. Pretty impressive. Just imagine in your head that's going on. Okay. So, um, agenda. We always have to have an agenda slide in the official briefing, right? You've got to have it. Okay. This is, uh, you know, i got to tell you what I'm going to tell you, that sort of thing. Quick takes, some numbers on the five different airplanes, because this is a family of aircraft. You go all the way from two-place LSA on up to a six place, somewhere around the size of a 185. Uh, pretty pretty wide uh, range of airplanes. All Bob Barrow's designs, so we're gonna talk about his design philosophy. Uh, we're also going to talk about the core materials and construction. Why do we have an airplane with a metal wing, uh, rag and tube fuselage, that sort of thing? What are the advantages there? Why would you want that? Okay, so we'll get to that. Um, those of you that have built that same combination or have uh, something like a uh, rag wing, uh, 120 and metal fuselage, you've seen the kind of flip side of that. So uh, the FAA calls that construction, oddly enough, composite when it's different types of materials in the same airplane. And then they had to change the name of advanced composites, oxy, that sort of thing to advanced composites. So just an aside there. Good and the bad. Um, I won't say bad, I'll say challenges of building a bear hawk because uh, Bob is a very traditional guy, the designer, and uh, uh, I, I've got a set of plans here. Just uh, treat yourself to a, a peek. Um, and then, uh, what have we done so far? That's Carlo. He's going to do show and tell. We're going to answer questions specifically on the patrol. So, uh, scope any questions at the end of this presentation to the patrol. Uh, Neil's going to cover uh, his material. He's going to talk about uh, the four place stuff, and then uh, we'll open it up at the end for questions generally across the. Uh, uh, range of different airplanes. Okay, so great uh, ground rules. 
By the way, it is an international uh, airplane. There's an awful lot of them out here, a lot in the U.S. Uh, South Africa has a bunch around Pretoria. And then finally, uh, Australia and New Zealand. There's a whole bunch of them there because it's a great bush aircraft. Okay. There we go. All right, quick takes. A Stolier Cessna 185. Is that a word? I don't know. But I made it up, so we're good. So really talking about a five to six place airplane, uh, that's the Bearhawk 5, uh, they're, uh, they're big airplane, anywhere between 260 and about 310 horsepower. Uh, short takeoff, greater volume than a 185. And you can get parts for it, because hey, you built the airplane. So we're good to go. The Bearhawk 4 place comes out of a Bob Barrow's requirement to haul engines out of his little postage stamp strip down in Roanoke. Uh, he's got to rebuild a uh, business down there. He needed something besides the 170 that he had, so he designed and built the uh, four-place Alpha model. Uh, you know, you're building a Bravo model. Uh, four-place Alpha model. Alpha model. Okay, Alpha model, four-place. So basically, the Bravo is the follow-on. They made a few changes, changed the airfoil, a few other things. But again, it's a true four-place airplane. Uh, you can run anything. Uh, between a 360 and 540 uh, in it. Uh, real nice, uh, wider cabin, greater baggage volume than a Cessna 180. Um, can still get a Lycoming engine in the back. Bearhawk 5 claims to be able to throw a crated Lycoming engine in the back, so that's fun. Uh, faster Super Cub is, is really the moniker for the uh, patrol. Better low speed handling as well, different airfoil. Uh, Super Cub is wearing an airfoil that was designed in the late 1920s. Uh, the rivulet airfoils, I think, are 1990s, so they're a little bit more docile, lower pitching moments for folks that, that sat through a dynamics and went too bored. Uh, so they work pretty well. Um, if you want a side-by-side -side Super Cub, that's the companion. We'll talk a little bit more about that because it's got some other cool characteristics. Uh, that's their really the most recent uh, airplane. And then finally, the LSA, the Bearhawk. Uh, uh, 1,320 pound gross weight, but can be built at 1,500 pound gross weight uh, in experimental amateur built. So, again, think about it as a modernized cup. Okay. Number wise, uh, what's obvious is that cruise speeds unusually fast for this type of airplane. Okay. Let's uh, talk a little bit about the four place 150 mile an hour cruise at 62 uh, percent power. And I think that is assuming that you've got, uh, I want to say, uh, 260 horsepower up front. Okay, so it's moving along pretty good, but you're still landing at 40 miles an hour. It's still a 200 to 500 foot rollout, rate of climbs are equivalent as well. Okay, so this is a, uh, a pretty good competitor when you start looking at malls and, and other airplanes in the class. Okay, uh, useful loads, uh, if, if you're doing the numbers in your head, uh, that's a significant useful load, put four adults in it, put gas in, and still go somewhere. That's a rarity on, on an airplane with only four seats. Okay. Um, the companion here is the fun one, 2,200 pound gross weight, uh, 1,250 pound useful load. <coughs> Let's say we build it really heavy and it's 1,100 pound useful load. That's a two-place airplane. Okay, I can put two 300 pound folks in there, fill it up with gas, um, just about max out the baggage compartment weight, and I'm still looking for stuff to throw on the airplane before I hit gross weight. So that's pretty impressive. And again, nice, comfortable 43-inch side-by-side seating on the companion. All of these are utility category load uh, in terms of the design. That's important for the viewpoint of, of rugged airframes. We'll get into that uh, here in the later slide. In terms of designing the Bearhawks, uh, they're utility stall airplanes. Utility stall airplanes are not meant to go pavement to pavement. They're meant to go out of grass strips, gravel strips, uh, uh, into uh, impromptu landing areas, that sort of thing. So as a consequence, they need to be rugged. Uh, that's one of the reasons why they've designed the utility category. Very few airplanes uh, that are uh, certified by manufacturers come out as utility aircraft at max gross weight. The Bonanza is one of the few that I know of. Okay. Um, a Super Cub, you got to be under 1,500 pounds to get down into utility category there, uh, which means that you can go out solo with a little bit of gas and go do utility category maneuvers. And that's it. Forget about dual instruction. 
That's right. Um, home shop construction, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Carlo uh, will talk about beating out ribs with a hammer. If you want to do that, you can buy them pre-made, but the bottom line is that there's nothing here that's too far beyond uh, of the home shop. It's not like you're going to have to uh, buy a bunch of specialized parts and stuff like that other than you know, put an engine on it, that sort of thing. Uh, we already talked about the airfoil. Um, we've got the riblet airfoil on that, which gives us about a five mile an hour edge in the B model versus the A model in terms of cruise, a couple of miles an hour on the uh, landing speed. Again, uh, some folks chase <coughs> higher cruise speeds uh, as a religion. Uh, other folks want to see that mile and a or two uh, per hour clipped off the lower end. They'll spend a lot of money to do that, to put VGs on, all sorts of other stuff. Uh, again, this airplane uh, comes in the door. All of these uh, five aircraft, currently the B model on the four place, come in with a, a really good airfoil that works pretty well. Big wing, that's always a key behind uh, getting uh, low landing speeds and docile handling characteristics. Finally, the uh, design for intended use, conventional gear just works better off airport. I, I know we see some tricycle gear airplanes now with a big, big nose wheel uh, competing in the uh, stall drags and stuff like that. But realistically, if you want to get down, things are tight, lock up a brake, goose it, pump the uh, tail off and swing around, that's a tail dragger, realistically. Okay, otherwise you're going to shut down, get out, drag the airplane around. Uh, oil damped uh, spring shock, V-style landing gear, spreads the loads across the bottom of the fuselage rather than concentrating them in a place where like a spring steel uh, landing gear light comes up. A little bit more structural efficiency, that leads to higher useful load. Okay, all those things contribute. Finally, big baggage compartments, <laughs> big access doors. Uh, you know, if you can get a light combing engine in the back of the Bearhawk 5 in a crate, uh, it's got to have a pretty good access door, and it does. Um, again, we already talked about this stuff. How am I doing on time? Committed to 20 minutes to see if I make You're it. at 12 minutes. There you go. All right. <laughs> Core construction. If there's a ribbon in the breeze, it's flush. Okay? So it's stronger, a lot less drag. Uh, single strut design. Okay. Well, we look at an airplane like a mall, we say, well, it's got a metal wing, right? Okay. No. It's got conventional wing structure. It looks like a, more like a cub or, or other piper designs underneath that metal skin. Okay, that metal skin is not carrying big torsional loads like it is with, say, a Cessna. That's why Mahler uses double struts. Double struts are incredibly draggy, lots of interference, okay? They look cool, but that, but again, single strut means lower drag, great structural efficiency. Again, uh, that's what we're after if we're going to get decent useful loads. Uh, fuselage and empennage, chromoly, still tubing. Um, anybody into race cars? Race cars, yes, I see a yes, yeah, sort of. Okay, what do they all have? They all have a chrome molly roll cage or do count, okay? Why? Because it protects the occupants, okay? Um, you'll see uh, some chrome molly um, um, uh, secondary and primary airframe um, uh, components on things like a Mooney, some other airplanes. It's because there's very few things better at keeping things out of the crew compartment in a crash event than chrome molly tubing. Okay, so again, off airport, austere operating areas and stuff like that sort of makes sense to use that. Plus, if I bang the airplane up, chances are it's not too bad. I can pry that tubing straight. I can get a little bit of duct tape out of the kit. I can fly out of there. I saw that time and again up in Alaska. So uh, it's just one of those things. Fuel system, keep it simple. Remember the KISS principle? Keep it simple, stupid, right? Pretty much every pilot's heard that at some point, and that's really what it is here. Gravity fed, dual fuel tanks sitting in the wing roots. Um, you do pass fuel through the cabin uh, for the sight gauges if you want to use sight gauges instead of capacitance gauges. Uh, but uh, realistically, you don't have a header tank. You don't have anything else like that uh, uh, in the cabin itself, which again, if you've been to the crash site, uh, I, flew into a couple in Alaska, and uh, pilots trying to thread their way through a couple of big spruce trees. Uh, it knocks the wings off. The fuel stays behind. They avoided uh, post-crash fires, but again, once you put fuel in the cabin, 
that becomes problematic. So again, Bob doesn't do it. Um, builder options, you can build from scratch. That means just, okay, I'll buy the plans, uh, I'll get some MDF to make some form blocks, I'll start banging out ribs. Okay, you can buy components or sub-assemblies uh, from at least two people. The uh, Bearhawk aircraft will sell them. You've got VR3, which uh, specializes in tubing kits for the airplane. Uh, I think they're Canadian. Um, you can go with basic fuselage or wing component kits. That means, okay, I'm going to buy the ribs pressed out, I'm going to buy the spars, I'm going to buy all the other stuff that needs to be bent up, and, and I'll go ahead and start riveting it together, sort of a semi kit. And finally, you get into the quick build kits. I'm not going to spend too much time on that because we have an expert uh, that will be presenting uh, a little bit later tonight. So, uh, other options you can have. Uh, the kit plane, or, uh, sorry, float plane provisions installed on the patrol. I think the four place now gives you an option to get those uh, aft mounts and the uh, heavier tubing uh, in the uh, in the uh, cockpit area that allow you to have uh, the two seat plane doors on the patrol. On the four place, you get uh, two doors automatically, but uh, uh, again, extended uh, range tankage as well. <clears throat> that was today's price, 62k. Um, I'm not sure what's happening with Vans, but if I were in the kit business, I'd be looking at what Vans is doing, what I've been doing, and trying to figure out whether I can stay afloat, because we've had a tripling of aluminum prices. Uh, we've got a 200% duty on Russian aluminum. Aluminum is one of those things, like oil, that the last couple of percent of supply determines what everybody pays for it, okay? So that's why you're paying triple the price for aluminum from spruce or wicks or whatever else, that sort of thing. That affects the manufacturers because once they run through all that old stock they have warehoused, what are they doing? They're competing with everybody else for the new stuff. So again, not a bad price for what amounts to a pretty complete uh, kit on this. You'd also get wing or basic fuselage <coughs> kits. All right, pretty good stuff. Um, Bob knows how these airplanes get used because he designed his airplane, the four place uh, that he was using initially, to work, not for fun, but to haul engines in and out of his strip. Okay, they fit Americans. Bob's about uh, 210. He's about an inch shorter than I am. I'm 6'2". Um, he's 78, so he's not quite as limber and spry. Uh, I'm not sure if he'd get into the front seat of your hats, Carlo, but uh, uh, we'd see. But uh, they fit Americans, they fly like sport planes because Vans and some of the other airplanes have just spoiled us, right? You get the, they talk about the, what the RV grin or Vans grin, whatever, um, because the airplane is just so great to fly, right? Um, now everybody wants their airplane that they, they buy in a kit form to fly well, okay? In other words, it's supposed to be fun to fly. Uh, if you've flown a 185, it's like a F-250 with wings. It's a truck. It feels like that when you're squiring it around the sky. These things are a lot more fun to fly. Um, robust crash for the construction. It's Bob Barrow's LSA prototype on its nose, clipped a wire at, uh, I think it's Top Sail Holly Ridge in North Carolina. Unmarked wire. Um, they have wires at both ends of that field. Dropped in from about 60 feet. Okay, not the ideal scenario for an arrival. Okay, this is that LSA, I think that is about 13, 14 months later. Okay, it's flying again. Bob's 78, okay, uh, and uh, rode the airplane in, uh, broke a leg, broke a few bones in his foot, uh, but he hobbled away, didn't walk away, but he hobbled away. So that, that's pretty good, and that's their LSA, that's their least robust airplane that they have, okay? So uh, that was enough for me, okay? In terms of crash worthiness, I'm big on that. The not so good stuff, uh, any scratch build, any planes build project, uh, it's one of those things where uh, there's a lot of head scratching, which means that you spend a lot of time wandering from hangar to hangar <coughs> looking for advice, okay? Um, quick build kits, a lot of that stuff is taken care of for you. There's still head scratchers uh, that you'll go find somebody that's done a RV-12 or whatever else, but in this case, it's complicated by the fact that the plans are 
pretty similar to what you'd find with a Pooper Pixie or some of the other 1950s and 1960s home builds. Okay, you're not going to find the CAD drawing, exploded assembly diagram, fastener by fastener callouts with helpful hints in there. Okay, uh, this is this is a uh, old time mechanical engineer that um, uh, uh, made his bones uh, basically uh, in the uh, late 50s and 60s. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, college and all that other good stuff. So, uh, you know, older dude that uh, <coughs> is a, uh, inks his drawings and stuff like that. So, it's so not so good. Uh, conventional gear stole airplanes. That means that pilot proficiency is assumed. Uh, so again, those are sort of the, the, I guess, challenges as it were. Okay, how are we doing on time? You're at 20. At 20, okay. <laughs> Big difference in cruise speed, big difference in, in uh, gross weight, that's pretty much all you need. Okay, if I'm 40 miles an hour faster than a Super Cub, basically in the same motor, I'm doing okay and I'm landing at the same airspeed. Carlo, you're up, man. All right. Good timing. So I, I really lucked out with Todd because I went in and, and the, you know, for those who know me, I'm a multiple airplane builder and I didn't really have another project in mind, but. This Oshkosh, and prior to Oshkosh, I didn't know what a patrol was. I thought Bearhawks were all four places. And I just casually walked by the Bearhawk booth and I said, huh, they got a two place. And I said, what's the chance that they do plans build option because I'm a plans builder? And the guy said, oh yeah, absolutely we do. I said, sign me up. So anyway, <laughs> and then yeah, shortly after deciding on it and, and sort of getting underway, uh, that little Bearhawk locator map came in very handy and I said, good grief, there's a guy just down the street that's building a patrol. And, and he came up and normally people who are building a plane will have the very much rudimentary tools and everything else and Todd came up with this gold mine of stuff that he's done. And people, you know, they, they say cost of doing business will do as little as possible to get the job done tooling wise. Todd has actually done pretty close to production tooling. I mean, you could probably build 10 or more uh, no, no, sets no, of no. planes. With no, these. no, no, I'm not. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. <laughs> but I mean, you could you could probably build 10 planes off these off these tools, and they won't get they won't get worn out. So they're really top quality tools, mm -hmm. precisely done. Really lucked out. Thanks, Todd. And I'm trying to return the favor with some. Uh, some stuff I do for him, you know. And I tell you what, that's all about. That's what home building is all about. It's a, it's a, it takes a village. And I'll tell you, as far as as far as the Barrows plans, yeah, you kind of have to be an expert, and you have to. With any plane like this, it's all about the forum and about the community. You've got to, you know, everyone sees the plans differently. They see they see subtleties that you might not spot, and uh, so this really helps. So anyway. Um, the uh, ribs are all hammer formed over these tools. Here's a uh, so here's a typical nose rib. So what you start out with is you get your piece of aluminum. This is a template just to lay it out. You just take a magic marker, uh, just lay out the uh, the shape, and then you just snip it out about half inch oversized, and then then you have a a, a, a duplicating punch, and you punch little marks in the uh, in the aluminum. On this on this tape on this rounding fixture, and uh, and then you just uh, once you got the holes located, you drill you punch or drill the holes. And these are the tooling holes that reference it, and you sandwich the metal in between these two, and then you just run the router, and these holes are perfectly, it repeats perfectly every time because you got you got these reference holes, and and all the ribs are exactly the same, and then then the next step is uh, you can either hammer form or hydro form. Um, in hammer forming, you basically squeeze the uh, you squeeze the uh, the nose rib or any rib between two blocks, and you you hammer the edge over. And of course, when it comes out, it looks like a banana, and you've got a flute and everything else. And you can see the rivet layout, the rib, uh, the rivet and flute codes are red and black. Uh, another option is hydro forming. So Todd's got a big. Air of a hydraulic hydroforming press, 20 ton hydro press in his garage, because who doesn't? And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and the, 
this has got a massive urethane block and it makes super short work of these uh, nose ribs. And there's an example nose rib here somewhere. Uh, and then for the stuff that's, wait, that's too big to do, this is a, uh, this is a sip rib. That's the biggest of all the ribs. I've actually elected to go whoop, cut this right off because I'm doing a composite trailing edge on mine. Uh, but this is, here you can see the airfoil. It's, it's kind of a fat airfoil for someone who has a Mustang too. that's only that big. <laughs> but it, it gives you warm, fuzzy feelings when, when you know you're not going to fall out of the sky when you're slow. And uh, so some of the things, uh, and by the way, here's a, uh, this, is a, this is a flap. It's a truly massive 104 inch flap. That's got a, a pretty sizable cord, and I think it's 50 degrees of deflection. It's yeah. it's a uh, the proverbial barn door. <laughs> and one of the things, a couple of things I've changed on the design is uh, because I've got stretch forming capability, shrink so stretcher like you guys have. They they called for a double rib in the root, and I I went with a uh, the doubled cap, and then put uh, beefier verticals on here. And the biggest change I've made to uh, things is I'm going with a wet wing. They call for a uh, they call for a welded tank that's supported by three straps. And uh, yeah, I'm used to wet wings. I'm used to pro seal. And then I'll tell you that that she's made friends with it too. And uh, yeah, so this is a tank. This is a typical uh, center rib. And uh, and then there's a, a big divider here that goes across four rib bays. And so mine's going to be completely wet. And uh, these are actually the fuel outlets. There's one in the front, one in the back, and then there's a breather at the outboard. And uh, so there's uh, yeah, some provisions you have to make for that. But I think the I think for me the the, the pros outweigh the cons. And uh, and I'll probably be able to have the same weight of structure with another other gallon or two. We'll, we'll see how much it ends up being. But it's all. Uh, yeah, you know, time in the tanks. So I think it's going to be a good, good thing to have that extra fuel, and we'll see if the if the pro seal holds up, and they don't have blue stains all over the show. Here's a typical weldment. The uh, the structure's got uh, instead of having thick ribs where the uh, where the aileron attachment and uh, and uh, aileron actuation and the flap actuation, they've got these uh, torque tubes that take the stress all the way to the main spar. So where you're, this is where the aileron, there's a bell crank here and it actuates the aileron here. And they've got a similar one where the uh, flap uh, actuates and, and all those torsional loads get transmitted <coughs> straight to the big beefy main spar. And nice weldments on these. And uh, there's nothing really, there's nothing really that with good tooling is, is insurmountable on these. It's uh, like I said, it's really the plans are Hard to read and and uh, sort of advanced, and that's uh, why, why do you end up with a hydroforming press just out of curiosity? Well, it's just a harbor freight because <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's cool. Believe <laughs> <laughs> me, it saves time if you well, see I'm, how that. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it saves time. You can buy a 20 ton, 20 ton press, sounds like oh, that's a couple grand, right? No, it's 150 bucks on sale. Okay, with with the manual jack bottle, for another 120, you can get the the air over hydraulic uh -huh. mode. So for under 300 bucks, I'm pressing out 20 ton stuff. And of course, um, I've got a um, um, finger uh, brake mod uh, or finger press mod that, that that goes in there. So all this quarter inch, three sixteenths uh, 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 heavy steel, you know, aircraft steel, that sort of thing, 4130 ends. Um, no problem at all, pencil like butter. So wow. um, it is a time saver and it makes things possible that uh, you would spend a lot of time sort of a hammer with. Yeah. I would say it would be uh, four hours you can do all the nose ribs for patrol on the hydro press. Wow. I mean, it, yeah, it oh. yeah. It moves. All right. Any control specific questions, I guess? Yeah, I, I guess we're both up here for this. Okay. Any other questions, other than my spending habits? Yeah. So. <laughs> um, Is that gear? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it it does. Uh, there's there's pretty good accommodation for uh, uh, both uh, uh, sizable folks and uh, less than sizable folks there. Uh, Great airplanes. If if uh, if you're on the uh, 
I think uh, it, it used to be once upon a time, you know, 170, 175 pounds, that sort of thing. Uh, it, it, it's great. So uh, get a lot of payload there. Um, and then uh, I think what, that's it. Yeah. I think there was a question. In the oh, go ahead. Carl, did, did, what wing is that? Was that your design or was that an option that, that is offered? No, it's my design. Your design? Yeah. yeah. One of the nice things about uh, doing a plans built airplane is um, if you have some confidence in your abilities and, and uh, uh, have the background to do it, you can make those major mods. So uh, he'll say, well, what do you think? Well, okay, he's the A&P. I've got an aero degree that I haven't used in probably 35 years. So um, I'll nod my head and go, yeah, does this sound good to you? And he's like, yeah, sure. Uh, all right, we'll do it. Well, one, so. of the, uh, one of the deciding factors in going with Wing was to call Bob Barrows and, and actually read what he was saying. And, uh, and his, basically, he was not against it. Yes. He just said, he said, look, it's, it's, it's doable. You just got to, you know, figure out the pitfalls of it. And, and, yeah. But it's not, it's not like he said, don't even think about it. He's, Great. Um, we're at time. Yep. Uh, any other questions for the patrol specifically? Go ahead. Did you guys, before, did you get to fly the airplane before building, or you no. just went away? I, I, I've not flown a patrol. Flown I, we were not. we were going to head down and do the Bob Barrows birthday fly-in, okay. uh, and got weathered out, unfortunately. But uh, we'll get there. And the funny thing is, I always preach to people before you start a project, go fly the airplane. And the last two planes I've done. Been on that, but yeah, but has been really nice fun plane, and the Mustang was fantastic. I've flown in one before, but this I haven't flown in. But once again, so many people saying so many good things about an airplane. Right. So. Yeah. Right. Um. All right. So uh, we're on to the main act here. Your opening yeah. act is completed. So. <laughs> <laughs> You have the controls. All right, thank you. You got it. All right. Is that four? Yep. Okay. That's it. Okay, so I'm there building the Bear Hawk four place, the Model A. Uh, this is a picture of Jared Yates, uh, four place. And he has a few kids, and you can see he's got some swings on the tie downs. <laughs> <laughs> And this fellow gave me a ride in that airplane, and then that, that was the only one I've been in, the only one I've had an opportunity to fly. So I did not go to the scratch build. Um, I built an RV-8A that I completed back in 2006, and with that one I built the wings and then bought the quick build fuselage. And when I got done that airplane, it was uh, very enjoyable and learned a lot, loved the airplane, but I said, never again will I build an airplane. <laughs> well, that all changed when I made a trip out to Idaho in a uh, Husky with four other airplanes, and we visited a bunch of backcountry strips, and we camped, and said, oh, this is pretty cool. I can't do this in my RV-8A. Um, and if we're going to go camping, my wife and I, we need as many comforts as we can pack in the airplane. <laughs> So I'm building a four place, not for four people, but for two people and a bunch of camping gear. So we'll see if that comes to be. Okay, so I decided to, as I said, not scratch build. So I found a fella down in Nitro, West Virginia, who had started this project and he built it from scratch. Um, he was a professional welder and uh, primarily TIG welding. Um, I went, and what was interesting was he and a buddy of his both worked um, for large companies and got early retirement buyouts and they were pretty young and they both liked the airplanes and uh, building things. Um, so they had somebody approach them and ask them to build a bear hawk for them. And then another fellow approached them. So they were contracted to build two bear hawks. Well, they built four of everything because they liked the airplane and uh, they wanted to have one for themselves. Well, 
what happened is they got this far along pretty much on both their projects and they just came to the conclusion they didn't have the funds and based on their age they didn't think they were going to be finish them so they decided to sell their projects so Pam and I borrowed a 20-foot trailer went down to went to West Virginia and picked this up um, so this was the way I got it this was in 2015 um, I started building the floorboards, and uh, unfortunately, I had a heating, heating and air conditioning uh, business with a complete sheet metal shop. So, of course, I had all the tools to cut the metal, bend it, and so on. This is at my home garage. Okay, now, this is the uh, this is made of stainless steel. This is on the bottom of the uh, boot cow. And that's where the exhaust uh, comes out, and also the uh, cooling air from the engine. Um, this is a Lycoming 0360 angled valve engine. Um, originally, that engine was uh, fuel injected and rated at 200 horsepower. Um, mine's going to be carbureted. The fellow that designed the airplane, Bob Burrows, he's the one that built this engine for me. So he said I should get about 190 horsepower out of it with a carburetor on it. The, uh, the fellow I bought the fuselage from, he had contracted with a fellow to make carbon fiber doors. Um, when I fit those doors on the frame, they didn't contact the frame all the way around the perimeter. So, so what I did was I ended up cutting these curves, the slots you see in the back, so I could flex it. <coughs> So I clamped it in place with the curves on the back, and then I laid up carbon fiber over top of the curves and let it set up, clamped to the fuselage. Um, I ended up making a stainless steel firewall, um, and see the angle iron or the angled aluminum around the perimeter. I bought a, a shrinker stretcher in order to curve that angle aluminum. Um, you'll see some firewalls have uh, galvanized firewalls and you know I know from welding or, or uh, brazing galvanized metal it'll make you sick so I didn't think it was a good idea for that to be the firewall <laughs> so this is the firewall um, with that part I showed you earlier where the exhaust uh, runs down underneath of. Okay, um, this was for the window frames. I did have to do some scratch building, so to speak. Um, I used my plasma table to cut out these pieces and then welded them up. Um, these are the, the baggage doors um, and the front door. And of course, you know, I made all the aluminum panels for that and the window frames. I had to sandblast the uh, fuselage and paint it. Um, I set up in my warehouse a sandblasting station. I also use that for painting. You know, it's every time you turn that fuselage 15 degrees, you found spots that you missed. <laughs> um, it's just never ending trying to sandblast. Because you think you got it all until you rotate a little bit. It's like, oh, damn. Same was true with painting. You know, I probably used a, gal I used a gallon of paint, but probably there's only probably a quarter of a gallon on the fuselage. <laughs> um, this is uh, for the seat. The seats are sliding. So I designed this pin um, to release the, the slide. Okay, so we... Uh, um, Todd had talked about the four place had an A model and a B model. Okay, the B model had the different airfoil and they also had ins uh, airfoils on the horizontal stabilizer and the uh, vertical stabilizer. So these were designed without that but I was able to get the uh, buy the wooden strips with the right profile and epoxy those to what I had 
So at least I'll pick up a little bit of speed and a little better uh, control at landing speed because of this modification. Okay, so this is the uh, elevator, uh, the counterbalance. You end up having to put about four and a half pounds of lead on each side to counterbalance that elevator. So usually what you do is you do something like you see here and you melt down lead and pour it in there. Well, I didn't like the idea of melting lead and pouring it in there and having it you know, burn the paint and so on. So what I ended up doing was I bought a big bag of lead shot and mixed it with epoxy and poured that down in there. So my thought is if I need to lighten this up, I on the bottom side, I will just you know, drill into it and remove lead and just make maybe a round aluminum, you know, access cover to cover up where I dug out the lead. And, uh, okay, so for covering, um, I didn't like the idea of an envelope. Uh, for one, I didn't want to have to sew anything, and I didn't want the seam up the center. So I wanted to use the blanket method. In order to use the blanket method, however, you need to have a structural member underneath the seam. So I des designed and installed this aluminum piece as a structural member for my seam. And this is immediately in front of the vertical stabilizer. Okay. So I had to mount the wings. And as far as the wings, I bought those from Avpro. Okay. So Avpro is now Bearhawk Aircraft. But they uh, sold and still sell quick build kits where you can buy the fuselage um, and the wings. So you have to fit these wings and the connection points, the holes drilled into the rear spar and the front spar are undersized. And that enables you to work that hole in one direction or the other in order to get it fit, to fit it perfectly to your fuselage, get the right dihedral and all, and all your right uh, angles. So fortunately, I have a friend, Tom Johnson here, that's got a big hangar and a lot of equipment and five minutes from the house. And he let me take it up to his hangar so I could fit these wings. So that's what's going on here. And he had this nice lift that you see on the left. Uh, it made it very easy to lift that wing up and I could put these wings on and off by myself as a result of that equipment. So the wing struts, uh, I had the, the wing kit came with the wing struts in these end pieces, uh, but you have to build the struts to the, the required length. Uh, this is my father helping me uh, drill those holes. Um, the windscreen is off of a, a 170 and you have to trim it to fit and this is what I was doing in this picture. So it was a matter of cutting a little bit, placing it on there, marking it, and uh, I did that I don't know how many times. You don't want to cut too much. Uh, the top view of that installed. Okay, and then I had to lay up the fiberglass strip to connect the windscreen to the top of the boot cow. Um, yeah, it looks like I was pretty sloppy, but that's all has two inch scotch tape underneath of it. And it was all waxed. Okay, and then I trimmed that uh, to the dimensions I wanted. And that brown covered uh, material you see, that's basically just body putty, filling in all the imperfections of the fiberglass weave and such. Okay, these are all the hinge brackets uh, for the wings. Uh, these came already as you see them, um, but they didn't have the holes in them. So I had to mark them for the holes and such. Um, and I'll have to say, you know, Todd made mention of this. If you build a Vans aircraft and you build something else, you've been spoiled. You don't know how easy you had it. <laughs> because Vans aircraft, the drawings, they have a lot of them and all the information's there. The Bearhawk, 
There's not many drawings. You really don't have written instructions. And there's a lot of interpretation to do. Uh, so this is the wing. It is quick built, but it's not finished. And there's actually quite a bit of work left to do. Um, you know, the quick build wings did come with the fuel tanks. You had to build all the straps for those. Um, installing all those hinges um, took a lot of time alignment wise and trying to uh, make sense of everything. This is a rotisserie that I built for the wing. Um, that rotisserie is also what I use now for the fuselage. Um, okay, so to align the flaps and the ailerons, I had to build a pretty substantial table uh, that you see underneath with the four by four legs. And then that table has two steel beams that run left to right. And then underneath of that is square extruded aluminum tubes that run perpendicular to the beams. And this is all to create a perfectly flat surface. The extruded aluminum tubes actually came off ladder racks from old service trucks that I'd saved. And I put those on my pool table, slate pool table, and they were perfect. And I couldn't believe it, all the years of ladders being hauled on top of them and piping and so on. So uh, it was a very rigid and flat table which allowed me to get everything aligned perfectly before I drilled the hinges. And there you can see the fuel tank installed. Um, and around the perimeter of that fuel tank, you can see all the holes. Every hole has a nut plate. I mean, uh, it's hundreds. So here's one of the, the hinges. Um, and here, the string in the center, that, that is to line them all up so the centers are all the same. Then once you get them lined up behind that hose clamp, you can see the hole. You drill through that and uh, put a ribbon. The, um, so to determine how much fuel is in the tanks, you have sight glasses um, that are on the inbound, most inbound rib of the main wing. So while you're in the fuselage, you look up to your right or left and look at these sight glasses. Um, on the forum, I read that some people were using sight glasses that they got from McMaster Car. Typically, this is what you'd use for like an expansion tank for a boiler, seeing what the water level is in it. So this is made of aluminum, um, but it was a little on the heavy side. So took it over to my brother's house. He has a milling machine. It only had a slot in the front. So we put slots on the other three sides. We ended up reducing the weight by about 50%. Okay, so this is another counterbalance. Uh, this is for the uh, elevators. Oh, not, not elevators, I'm sorry, ailerons. So these are aluminum tubes that slide into the elevator, uh, into the nose of the elevator. So these are filled with lead. So what I did with these, since I had shot left over, I epoxy bushings into the end that had uh, one eighth uh, national pipe thread, uh, female threads, and I poured shot into those aluminum tubes. The idea being that I left those plugs on there. I can undo those plugs and dump out some of that shot if I'm too heavy. Um, I actually have a couple extra inches that I can add shot if I need to. So that's what that's about. Okay, this is the, uh, the fuel tank fill cap. So the cap uses a big O-ring that you see here. The problem is that O-ring's too big in diameter to fit in that hole. So I modified that O-ring so it's flat, as you can see on the left side. And the way I did that, was I put the O-ring on the chuck of my drill press, turned on the drill press, and then that's a die grinder with a three-inch sanding disc on it that I ran while it was rotating. <laughs> it worked out pretty nice. And if you read on the forums, people have problems getting those caps in. 
But the, this does two things. It allows me to get it in easily. It's still a little snug fit. And it gives me uh, more surface area that comes in contact to seal. Okay. So, let's see. I'm trying to remember why I did this. So I'd already fitted the wings. You saw that earlier. Um, so I had to put the wings back on so I could build all the control cables. So I bought a drywall lift and attached foam pads to the top of it. And that enabled me to lift that wing up and down by myself. So I was able to install both wings with the struts and I made up all the cables. Um, so I had all the control surfaces and flaps working before I started covering excuse me, the airplane. Okay, so the fiberglass wing tips that they send with the quick fill, the way I, I believe they want you to install them is to slide them over the wing. Well, that looks pretty sloppy. It leaves a, a raised edge all the way around the perimeter. So I didn't like that. So I ended up putting an aluminum strip <coughs> all the way around. That's what the Clecos are holding on. And then I trimmed that fiberglass uh, wing tip uh, to fit all, to fit perfectly, and it's held on with uh, you know, screws that go in the nut plates. And those screws are all countersunk. All right, and here I'm getting ready to close up the wings. Um, oh, and earlier Todd was talking about that, or not Todd, but Carlo. That one weldment that goes between the main spar and the rear spar. That's what he's talking about right there. Mm -hmm. Another thing that's interesting is they tell you it's 50 degrees of flaps. And when you're sitting on the ground, it's about that. But when you're flying, these springs are the only thing that hold the flaps down. It'll end up retracting to about 40 degrees, is my understanding. <coughs> And this is the process of finishing up the riveting on that wing. And this is something I was used to doing from the RV. Okay, then we got into uh, you know, the covering process. Um, they're talking about the counterbalance for the uh, aileron, that hole right there. That's what that aluminum tube with the shot slides into. Okay, this was the uh, rudder horn. Um, I, I mean, ended up making that from scratch. <coughs> mm -hmm. And that is the, uh, the rudder. And then uh, rib stitching. Uh, I must, must have watched a YouTube video a hundred times. <laughs> Had it on my tablet right beside me. And Ernie lent me a you know, a test uh, frame that they built here. And I kept trying and trying until I could do it without thinking. So uh, it's pretty easy once you know how to do it. Um, this is a hard point. I installed several hard points on the fuse slide so I could mount antennas and such. And the cables you see there, that's for the trim, uh, the elevator trim. And these are the rudder pedals and uh, the tubing. Um, I ended up the interconnecting tubes between the cylinders at the bottom. That's all stainless. I was able to bend those so they don't interfere with them, each other or anything else as they're twisting. I wanted to minimize the amount of flexible t tubing I had. Um, this is the landing gear. You can see the nitrogen bottle behind it. Um, the brake line runs down underneath the fabric, so I wanted to make sure I didn't have any leaks before I covered that. Um, I did make provisions, so this is the landing gear already covered. On the back side, you can see all the inspection rings, but hopefully I won't have to cut into those. And all my inspection rings, I made out of aluminum. I didn't want the plastic. I was worried about the holes stripping out. Uh, these were access covers I made for the ceiling inside the fuselage. 
Uh, there's the trim wheel at the ceiling of the fuselage. Uh, and if you, on the bottom there, you can see the sight glass for the fuel. And, uh, as I said earlier, I wanted to cover with the blanket method. So you cover the bottom first. Uh, this is the left-hand side. And this is the right-hand vertical stabilizer. Then uh, covering the left-hand side of the vertical stabilizer. And then covering the top of the airplane. And that, that, that rotisserie has saved me I don't know how much time. But uh, if you ever build one of these, make sure you take the time to build rotisserie. It's well worth it. Okay, so I had it. Everything's covered. Now I'm in the paint booth applying coats of, uh, this is poly brush. So I had never built a fabric airplane before. Um, if you haven't built one, it's amazing how many coats of material you end up having to put on to uh, the fabric. Uh, it's just like it never ends. Okay, after you put that orange uh, poly brush on, then you have to put on this silver, what do you call it, poly spray. And the whole reason for the silver is it's UV protection. Um, it also acts as a good filler, you know, primer filler. Um, so, but you have to wet sand it. Um, say, you put several coats on, you wet sand it, and spray on what you sand it off. And if you're happy with the way it looks, and it's nice and smooth, then you can start putting your top coats on. Probably sand it off more than I put on. Okay, so this is the, the fuselage uh, with the poly spray on it. Um, so I was looking at all that tubing that I didn't want poly spray on in the front there. And it's like, God, it's going to take me forever to you know, paper all this. So I ended up getting tin foil. Use some tin foil. It seemed a little easier to work with. So here you're seeing horizontal stabilizers and uh, let's see, and the elevators that are painted. The airplane is going to be red and white. Uh, and if you're ever thinking about if you're thinking about painting in your garage, look at that floor. <laughs> okay, so this is the fuselage. Um, Right now, it has, uh, in this picture, it has the, um, let's see, polytone. And I used the polyfiber system. But the polytone is basically a semi gloss paint. Um, and it's semi gloss at best. Um, you can buff it. So I decided to go with the gloss finish which is uh, in polyfiber, it's either the ran thing or the arrow thing. It's a one stage paint that you mix a catalyst with. <coughs> so it's red, you have to have white underneath. Red and yellow, you gotta have white underneath. If you're using a lot of the other colors, you could paint directly over the silver. So I had to paint the fuselage white since I was using red. So what I'm doing here is uh, this is the bottom of the fuselage, which is white. So um, I was getting ready to paint the white glossy ran thing on. So here I'm laying out my striping where the white meets the red. And if you look here, I already have the glossy. Uh, you can see the line right here, the paint line. But this is the glossy white grand thing. So with that radius, I was like, man, how am I going to make that radius so it doesn't have any flat spots? So I went to Home Depot just aimlessly wandering, looking at things. I thought I came up with something that would work, but I got it home, it didn't work too well. So 
I started roaming around the house. Well, this is a 3 16 inch, six foot steel rod. I was able to secure it to the door in the front. You can see the clamp. And also I was able to clamp it to the window frame and then tape it securely in the back. But then I just paralleled that with that blue um, striping tape you see there. Worked out pretty well. Okay, so uh, this is the fuselage upside down in the spray booth getting ready to paint the red on. You can see the blue lines, that's striping tape. Because there's some uh, red pin striping. Okay, and then this is uh, the fuselage with the red on it. The striping is kind of, the camera kind of puts some you know, uh, diagonal lines on it. I don't know why. But... That's it. That's it. Oh, That's where it currently is. <laughs> That's what it currently looks like in your garage. Yeah. Anybody got questions? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you use do you use polytone to base the aerothane over for the white? Yeah. yeah matter of fact, I ended up painting all my parts in the white uh, polytone uh, because <coughs> most of the aerothane. <coughs> And it was just as far as, uh, I didn't have to do it under the white brand thing, but if you just, it was already in, on the rotisserie, and I didn't want to paint edge, the paint line, you know, a, a bump. So it's like, yeah, I might as well paint it off the bottom of the few slides, and that's silver. So. It's lighter than the aerothane that you get the same weight as Yeah. And you know what? Well, you've done fabric airplanes. You know, my conclusion after painting everything with that poly uh, tone was it marred very easy. And, you know, you still had areas like for some of your... It's hard when you have a corner, an outside corner on, say, your uh, elevators or um, you know, the rudder, to not have some fibers from the fabric sticking out. What I found with the, uh, the shiny stuff, the ranthane, is it makes those stiff enough that you can trim them off and make that kind of disappear. Um, but the ranthane is a lot more durable than polytone. You don't have to worry as much about stains from fuel or oil or bird poop, whatever it may be. Um, yeah, there's a weight penalty, but in the long run, I think it's worth it. Um, so. Neil, what, what weight fabric did you use? Okay, so on the bottom of the airplane, I used heavy. <coughs> on the uh, sides and the top, I used the medium. Um, the horizontal stabilizer that I started out with, heavy on the bottom, medium on the top. But what I found was the scallop, the scallops that you'd get between the ribs was much more pronounced with medium fabric than the heavy fabric. So I ended up ripping the fabric back off the horizontal stabilizers and putting heavy top and bottom. Um, for the vertical stabilizer, I used heavy on that. Um, to be honest, I forget my rationale. <laughs> Um, but I also, on the, uh, the elevators are heavy and the rudder is heavy. So. And another thing I learned too is, and anybody's worked with fabric has probably found this out, that scalloping you get between the ribs, it's much more pronounced if you lay the fabric one way versus 90 degrees. Because this fabric comes in six foot widths and there is more fibers in one direction, you know, count wise, than the other direction. So as a result, it shrinks up tighter in one direction than the other. And you want to shrink up, the tighter it shrinks up between those ribs, the more of a scalp you'll get. So if you lay it so you have the less shrinkage between the ribs, 
the less of that scallop, that dip you get. And uh, stuff like that drives me nuts. <laughs> and, uh, the top of the fuselage, scalloping is pretty pronounced in the front. I almost ripped it off and put heavy on the top, but it's like, eh, eh, gotta draw a line somewhere. Right? Mm -hmm. So. So what's left? Um, just wrap up. Any, any general questions? Oh, as far as finishing your airplane. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So I still have some painting left to do. Um, and this red you see right here, I had some dull spots, and they were bugging me. So I sanded and buffed those areas. Well, it didn't buff, didn't buff out too bright. So since this picture here, I have wet sanded all of that red, and I'm going to repaint it. But uh, my buddy that has the, the body shop, he's been extremely busy, so I couldn't get in last weekend, and I can't get in this weekend. So I want to finish the painting. And once the painting's done, I'm going to put it back on the, the landing gear and uh, hang the engine and start doing the things I really enjoy. Thank you. Very exciting. Thank you guys. Anything else? <coughs> Thank you to our three presenters.